From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place in a comfortable environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. So there's been lots of discussion about national security issues these days. The Soviet Union is gone, but a new formed Russia has been shaking the earth with cyber warfare and ransom attacks of all sorts. And they've been criminalizing refugees effectively around the world. And so we've got our hands full coping with those kinds of problems. And in the South China Sea and elsewhere, China is using island building to expand their southern turf and a belt and road approach to uh, indebt much of the third world to China. So we've got potential military threats of a different nature from all over the world. Our speaker today is particularly savvy on all these issues. He grew up as a young athlete, as a wrestler, and in fact, a mixed martial art karate athlete as a youngster, and went on to graduate from West Point, then go on to Army Ranger School. That's an even rarer combination. And then go on to law school, go on to teach law for a while, and then go to work for the Pentagon and spend a career being an Army lawyer. He has an additional master's in uh, criminal law and another master's in strategy. We are very pleased to be welcoming Brigadier General Patrick Houston to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Patrick, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks, Ron. It's fantastic to be here. I'm interested to hear all about your early childhood. Lots of guys who are on this show start out by being young sailors. What's the first time you were ever on a boat of any kind? I think probably when I was about six, seven years old, uh, but not a sailboat. Tell us about it. What kind of boat? Where were you? Why were you on it? Uh, my grandparents had a boat, um, and it was a motorboat, probably about a, a 40 some foot of power, power boat down in Southern California. I'd spent some time with them on it. Great. So why did you choose to go off to West Point? Tell us about your initial aspirations. I, I really wanted to be an Army Ranger for reasons that I can ex- explain more in more detail later, but that was, that was my plan. And I thought that was a, a path to get me to become a, an Army Ranger. So you go to West Point. You know all the way through it that there's a pretty this is a pretty competitive environment, West Point. Holy cow. And so after you get out of West Point, tell us your progression. How do you go from there? What's the next step? How do you get to go to Ranger School? How do you qualify to do it and so on? Yeah, you apply for it, you get accepted, you go, you do that. And uh, it's sort of a natural progression, I'd say. It's uh, it's it's a very natural progression coming out of West Point to go to Ranger School. Tell me something that was tough at West Point. For me, it wasn't any any acute toughness. It was just the chronic toughness and exhaustion of having to live in, in a sort of a, a somewhat oppressive environment for four consecutive years. It, it grates over over time on you. Right. Give me hours of a, of a cadet at West Point. What time do you wake up? What time, you know, what time do you do what? Oh, gosh, you're really stretching the bounds of my memory, Ron. You know, this wasn't yesterday that I was there, but uh, you, you wake up early and you go to bed late, a lot like uh, most college students with the studying, but then you throw in there mandatory athletics, you throw in mandatory marching and inspections and, and uniform drills, and it just makes for a pretty full, complete day. Uh, you know, as much as I didn't enjoy some aspects of it, I honestly believe that it was a very good education, and I can really look back and appreciate all that I learned at West Point. Give me the chronology. What did you do right after West Point? Where were you assigned? Straight, straight to a ranger school. Um, and then and then following that, I went on to uh, to go to Germany. Where was ranger school? It's a, at, the, at the time, it was in four different locations. It starts in Fort Benning, Georgia, and then it goes into the, uh, the mountains of Dahlonega, Georgia, northern Georgia, um, up along the Appalachian Trail. Then you go down to the swamps of in Florida, and then you go out to the deserts in Utah, and then you come back and finish in uh, at Fort Benning, Georgia. And what kind of hours? Give me give me a, a little bit of a day. I'll tell people a little bit about ranger training. There are how many day how many hours in the day? Twenty four, I believe, I, and that's what I believe the, the standard day was. You remember when you wake up? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to remember going to sleep to remember waking up. <laughs> part of it is sleep deprivation food deprivation see how you uh, how you respond in, uh, in in the worst of times it really just teach you that 
you know, things could be pretty bad and miserable. Okay, so then after you get out of ranger school? Uh, Germany. Okay, what do you do in Germany? It was a little chronology of your career. After ranger time, I went to flight school and became a pilot, did pilot, in, piloting throughout Europe, uh, stationed in Germany, went all over uh, Europe at the time doing that, then went to law school. What were you flying? Helicopters, uh, UH-1, old Huey models. Great. Okay, then you go to law school. Then I went to law school. And which law school? Yeah, the University of Colorado and out in Boulder, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Now, that's known to be a party school. So I don't know. Can an, an Army guy who's going to be a general uh, completely participate in the recreational party activities? Ron, I think you're thinking of the undergrad. The law school is 100% solid study, not a, not a single ounce of fun. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So you go to law school, then after law school, then what? I went to Korea. I started out as a prosecutor um, and did some other jobs uh, in Korea. Mm -hmm. As an army lawyer, as a prosecutor, give me a typical kind of a case. Or give me what, what kind of cases you would get. Uh, the, the whole gamut from, from minor cases where you're just advising people on more like employment law, like how to handle people who are just problem soldiers, uh, to outright criminal activity, prosecuting rape cases, murder cases, aggravated assaults. All the, all the typical cases you'd see in any criminal jurisdiction. And you would be an army prosecutor? Yep. Okay, so you're on the prosecutorial side of the game. Yep. And so then when do you go off to get the, a, a master's in criminology? For, for the, the army is a strange law firm and that every single person who's selected to be a partner in our firm, the, our, our equivalent of that is when you get promoted to major. We send every single one of our attorneys uh, at the mid at the mid career point for a one-year master's degree program to get a specialized law degree. And that's back at our, uh, at our law school that the Army runs in Charlottesville, Virginia. I, I later went back there a, a couple of times in a couple of different capacities. Uh, but I will say that we, we all go back there for one year to get a specialized law degree. Mine was in criminal law uh, because at that time, I really wanted to focus on, uh, on, on the path for criminal law. Great. So um, now you've had an incredibly interesting career. Let's see your deck. I'd love to see um, your, the presentation you have. All right. Let's let's get this thing started. Well, I'll just uh, I'm going to go back a little bit and just tell you you know what a what an impressive reputation this speaker series has. Fifty speakers a year, Ron. I know all coordinated by you, but fifty five years running. Uh, truly world class event. I'm really honored to be here, but I confess that I am a little intimidated as a soldier at a yacht club event. So I'm gonna try to overcome my stage fright and, and make it through this um, and, and share some thoughts about the sea and, and leadership. And I already started by telling you a little bit of my family history, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit more. My, my grandfather was in the Navy during World War II. And he taught me the story that, or the, the lesson that nothing ruins a good war story more than a live witness. <laughs> a great last night. I'm, I'm hoping that there are no witnesses in our audience that are going to discredit my stories out there. Um, that was my grandfather. He sailed out of, uh, out of the port, the bay here in San Francisco during World War II. My father wasn't in the Navy, he was in the Army. And he actually flew out of San Francisco on his way to Vietnam. My sister was in the Navy. So you're starting to see we have a really mixed family. <laughs> and then obviously I, I was in the army, but I want to go back even before that to the time you asked me about the time I was growing up uh, on my grandparents' boat. I will tell you, I spent two or three weekends a month out there with them on, on that boat. And the first thing I remember is the extraordinary amount of maintenance uh, that the boats require, the upkeep. Um, the audience knows the old adage that the second best day of your life is, is the day you buy your boat. And of course, the very best day is the day that you sell the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but my parents' boat had beautiful mahogany wood trim and, uh, and railings around it. And what I remember is my grandfather, the Navy veteran, would meticulously sand and revarnish that wood. He'd start on one side of the boat, work his way around the boat until he got finished. And by the time he finished about a year later, it was time to start all over again. It was a never ending process, but I, I think he found it very therapeutic and watching him, I will tell you that I learned 
about patience and attention to detail from him. Very thankful for those times. One of those other things that I learned during that time um, was, I would say, that's my grandfather. My grandmother was a, a very different character. She was a larger than life personality and a force to be reckoned with. And I'll, I'll talk about her. Uh, but I also learned about the freedom uh, and, and independence out there. When I, when I got to ride around in my little eight foot rowboat, uh, and that was that dinghy was my domain. I was the captain of that thing. I went everywhere in the harbor. And, and we, we were, uh, the marina that we were at was in Channel Islands Harbor down in Southern California. And I explored every bit of that harbor in the rowboat. I, I fished and I crabbed and I found it to be very liberating to be out there and what were, for me were the high seas. Um, I'll also tell you that over time, I eventually noticed that the, the large ships, and in, compared to my rowboat, everything was a large ship, but the large ships would go in and out of the harbor entrance. And I was always wondering what's out there. And so, so one day when I was nine years old, I decided to go see for myself. And so I started rowing and rowing until I got to the harbor entrance. And when I got out there to the breaker rocks, I kept going. And the first thing I noticed when I got out beyond the breakers was the size of the swells, much bigger than I was anticipating once I got out into the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, I was, I was two feet off the water in this rowboat. And when I, you know, for most of the time I was below the swells, the only thing I could see was a, a wall of seawater around me. I'd go about five seconds in the bottom of the swell. And then about every sixth second, I would pop up and be able to see all around. And then I'd go right back down into the swell. And that was how it went as I, I kept on rowing and rowing out there uh, for quite some time. I'll, I'll, it's obvious that my curiosity as a nine-year-old far exceeded any common sense that I should have. <laughs> uh, but I remember I finally noticed a ship out there and it seemed to be generally headed toward me. Um, and it, it started coming closer and it got bigger until you know, I started realizing this is a massive ship. If, if I had to guess at the time, I would have told you it was approximately the size of the Titanic. Um, and it continued to get closer and it did finally come right up alongside of me, uh, maybe 20, 30 feet away and it stopped. And I, I know now that this was a Coast Guard cutter, a white and orange Coast Guard cutter. I know it's not exactly the size of the Titanic, but it, it did seem like it to me. It stopped right there alongside me and, and I, was, I was terrified. And, I, and then I heard a voice on a bullhorn and it said, turn around and go back to the harbor by order of the United States Coast Guard and your grandma. <laughs> And then they said, do you, need, do you need any assistance? And I'm like, oh, absolutely not. I, I am I'm not going to embarrass myself any further by asking for help. I, I turned around and I started rowing. I made it back to the harbor. I made it back to the boat. And when I got back to the boat, I, I finally worked up the courage to, to ask my grandma how she figured out where I was and then um, how she got the Coast Guard to come and intercept me. And she said, well, it was easy. I, I told them your grandfather was an admiral. And I said, Grandpa wasn't an admiral. And she said, you know that, but they don't know. <laughs> that, just, that just tells you uh, kind of how my life was. You know. so, and, and now you see exactly, Ron, why I didn't go in the Navy and why I ended up choosing West Point over the Naval Academy. A, a very inauspicious start a, a, as a young mariner out there. Um, this picture is from West Point, our first test at technology here. Um, from my end, at least, the, the PowerPoint slide seems to be working. That's a, a good sign. So <laughs> I, I also have now revealed to the entire audience that my family has a history of lying to federal authorities out there. Uh, but, but you did ask me to talk a little bit about my time in the military. So I'm going to walk through some of that. We've already touched on some of it. We'll keep going a little bit. And you know, feel free to, to throw questions at me as we go or save them to the end. It doesn't matter to me. I can handle them. Any, anywhere long we go. Uh, but I'd like to start with a short video that really proudly highlights American military might. And that's gonna be represented here, as you'll see by the US Navy and the USS Montana, which is the second largest warship in the Atlantic fleet. Thanks, you know, 
Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. I'm <laughs> sorry. This is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Hello? Captain? This is a lighthouse, mate. Your call. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I do love that. <laughs> the audience can know that I just recently sent to Patrick a funny piece of humor the Navy guy sent me about uh, West Point just a, a day or so ago. So the fun rivalry between the Army and the Navy, I actually think makes you guys really, really better. And I know that you're all brilliantly loyal citizens, but it is fun to watch the rivalry between them. Oh, I completely agree. And it's tremendous mutual respect. But, you know, it's Army-Navy week. This is It's the oldest college football rivalry out there. If we can't poke fun at each other, then, you know, <laughs> we've got no place uh, in, in this business. But it really is. Outside of this week, uh, it's the, one of the strongest and most incredible partnerships you can ever uh, imagine. So, yeah, I'm really, really proud of, of all of my brothers and sisters in, throughout the military. So this guy, who's this guy here? Well, this, this is me um, as, as a youngster, um, and you see that the joy on my face, uh, this, you know, I, I would love to sit here and tell you uh, about all my success stories and, and stunning victories in life, Ron, uh, but unfortunately, that would only fill about a minute, and we're, I know we're trying to fill 30 minutes here, so instead, I'm going to focus on my failures, um, and there are so many more of those to choose, just a hell of a lot of material for us to go through. And I've honestly learned far more from my failures than I ever had from any of my occasional successes out there. I, I think of Thomas Edison and his quote about the, you know, the 10,000 failed efforts to, to invent the light bulb and how he interpreted them as not a failure, but 10,000 uh, times where he proved exactly another way uh, to, to not create a light bulb. And I love that spirit of, of optimism out there. So I'm going to start with, as we mentioned before, my short career as an army ranger, because as I said, I, I really anticipated that I wanted to have a career as an army ranger. Uh, that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. My dad had been an army ranger and his stories really inspired me. But I quickly learned that life as an army ranger is hard and, and dangerous. I, I remember being tired, completely exhausted, cold and hungry. And it honestly was not fun. And you, you can see some of that in my face here. I also remember a miserable night parachute jump that left me bloody in pain and missing all my front teeth. Um, and so I started thinking about alternate courses, alternate paths in the military. And I quickly settled on the notion of becoming a pilot because you know, I saw the pilots who picked us up in these godforsaken swamps and then they flew us to the side of some incredibly ridiculously steep mountain. And then they drop us off fly back homes and sleep in their nice warm beds. And that seemed pretty good to me. So I said, yes, I'm going to become a pilot. So I went to flight school and then spent a few years as a helicopter pilot. But what I didn't know at the time, what I didn't fully understand was that helicopters are an aberration of aeronautical engineering. It's a ridiculous design that should not work. There's no explicable reason why these things should ever get off the ground and fly. Um, now, that will lead to some flying misadventures on my part, but uh, before I get into those, let me share at least one other failure with you out there, and this was when I was a young pilot in Germany. I was a 23-year-old lieutenant, and I was part of a large U.S. Army aviation organization that flew troops uh, around Europe, and my team was getting a new boss. His, his name was Major Tom Young, and he was coming from an elite flying unit. He had an incredible reputation as a great pilot and a great leader. And when he arrived, it's clear that he was assessing us. And I now know that he came to the conclusion that we were a mediocre unit and that we could be a lot better. And so within a month of arriving, 
he announced that we were going to plan and execute the largest helicopter operation that had ever been done in Europe with over 50 helicopters. And I'll tell you, at first, everyone was shocked and a little bit in disbelief. And it was, it was ambitious and seemed a little bit out of reach. Uh, but he was very confident. And he said, listen, don't worry. We're not going to do this tomorrow. We're going to do it in six months. And then he laid out a progressive plan. We were going to do a little bit more each month, progressively larger, more complex operations with more helicopters. And then every time we took a step forward, we do the mission first in daylight where it's easier and safer. And then we do that same mission again at night. Um, and that was the progression. And everyone warmed up to the plan. Excitement built around this plan. Everyone wanted to be part of something historic. And each month we grew from six helicopters to 12 helicopters to 24 and 36. And as we went, I was one of Major Young's assistants. I was helping him plan this stuff and, and learning a lot from him as we went. And then one month before the big day, a month before the mission, he called me into his office and he said, Patrick, I want you to give the air mission brief to all the crews before the mission. Now, let me tell you how this works. That's not how it works. A lieutenant does not give this brief. The colonel usually gets up there and gives the brief. Maybe, maybe a major sometime, but, but never a lieutenant, and certainly never a lieutenant on a mission as big as this. So I was kind of in disbelief. But he insisted, said, no, you're going to do this, but don't worry. I'm not going to throw you into this ill-prepared. You're going you're gonna to practice this, and you're going to rehearse it in front of me. I'll make sure that you're ready. So I, I was smart enough. I was intimidated. Ron, but I'll tell you, I was smart enough to know that he was giving me an opportunity and I didn't want to screw it up. So I worked my ass off. I, I worked and prepared and prepared and prepared. I memorized every aspect of this mission. I knew all the aircraft involved. I knew all the crew members. I knew their call signs. I knew the flight routes. I knew the radio frequencies, refuel options, all the contingencies, all the what ifs. I had it all memorized and, and I spent weeks doing this. And I prepared my presentation I what if everything in every possible way. And when it came time to sit down in front of him to give him my practice rehearsal, I was ready. And I laid out every detail brilliantly. It was a, it was a fantastic week. Like, you know, when you nailed it, Ron, and I nailed it. And I, and I finished it up. I felt really, really good. And he looked at me and he said, that was terrible. And it was like a it was like a punch in the gut because I realized he was serious and I I, I I I couldn't figure out what was going on. He saw that I was in pain and he said, "Listen, it, it's obvious that you worked hard, you prepared a lot, you know this operation inside and out, but your delivery was terrible." He said, "You've got to think about it from your audience's point of view. So you you have been practicing this mission for six months. You know every detail inside and out." But your audience is hearing this for the first time. You can't go in and lay out every single contingency. You need to start simple. Go from beginning to end as if everything goes just perfectly. So they understand exactly how things are supposed to happen. He goes, now we know it's not going to go perfectly. But then and only then can you go back and start explaining the what ifs. What if you lose communications? He goes, only then does that make sense. I, I went back. I completely reconfigured the brief. I gave it the following week. The briefing went fine and the mission went fine. But I'll tell you uh, that it was super powerful for me to, to, to hear that. And, and over the course of the six months with Major Young, I learned some really, really powerful lessons and, and, and several good leadership lessons. And I want to I share five of them with our audience here today because they've served me well over the course of my time. So number one, Set high goals for your organization. Um, you know, he came in, he was not content with mediocre performance, and he set high, high goals, not, un, not unreasonably or unachievably high. Um, they were realistic, uh, but, but they were high goals, higher than we thought we could achieve ourselves. Number two, you have to communicate your vision and your plan in simple terms. He, his simple message was, biggest operation ever done, 50 helicopters, historic. That message resonated, everyone got it. Everyone knew exactly what their role was in this plan, what we were trying to achieve, and it was a simple thing to get across. Number three, what I learned for him is empowering the people who work for you. He should never have let a young 23-year-old lieutenant handle a major role like giving that brief, but yet he, he trusted me. 
you know, he didn't let me go run wild, of course, but, but he empowered me. He didn't micromanage folks. He did what I would call macro manage. He would send people out there with all sorts of freedom to do their, their work, let them get outside their comfort zone and give them chances to excel. Number four on the list, you know, you've got to coach people, develop them and mentor them. And th this is really the essence of leadership out there. If Tom Young had left me to my own devices, let me do that brief without a rehearsal, it would have been a disaster if I had briefed the crews that same way. Uh, but instead, he taught me how to improve. And I'm going to add for all of us out there is that as we look to mentor the next generation of leaders for, for the up and coming people in our field, it doesn't matter what, whether we're talking about the legal field or the technology field or, or, or medicine or the military, um, we have to provide opportunities out there. And, and we've got to be thinking about diversity and inclusion. We can't just give opportunities to people who look like us. If we're looking for real hidden talent out there, we really have to give people equal opportunities across the board and search for that hidden talent. And fifth and finally, what I'll share with you is how much I learned from him about the importance of tailoring your message for the audience. You've heard me say how, you know, how he taught me about tailoring it for the flight crews who were hearing it for the first time. But I will tell you, that's a lesson I took into my next career as a lawyer. I realized that every case I prepared for, every time I was going before a jury, Ron, I had practiced and, and been working with that case for months. I knew the, I knew the details of the case. That jury was going to be hearing it for the first time. And that caused me to rethink my approach. And I can't tell you the number of times I saw opposing counsel get in there and give extraordinarily complex, brilliant arguments to the jury that I sensed just went completely awry because people didn't really have the experience with the case to understand it. You got to start simple and get more complex build from there. So the, those are some of these really important lessons that, that he imbued on me and I think are, are worth sharing. I'm happy to share with folks because he was, it was an extraordinary leader who was, was helpful for me. You know, and along those same lines, I think we all learned the idea of practice makes perfect. You got to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. So those are, those are some of the stories out there I'll, I'll share with you as, as just a young officer. Uh, but I do have some mishaps as an actual pilot uh, to, to share as well. I wasn't very good there either, I guess is the way to say it. The, the three worst things that can happen if, if you're in a helicopter, the third worst is that you can have a complete hydraulics failure. Helicopter requires a lot of minute uh, controls, movements, and you can't, just can't do that without the hydraulic or you know, power steering that, that it, you typically have on it. The second worst is to have a complete engine failure. That's bad for obvious reasons. But the worst thing, the number one worst thing in a helicopter is that you can lose your tail rotor. And that's the small little rotor on the back of the helicopter that keeps you from spinning. Um, and as a pilot, I had the misfortune of experiencing all three of these. Uh, and I've been told that I'm the only person known to have experienced all three of these and, and still be alive. Um, not, not, not a distinction that I'm happy to have, but, uh, but I will say this, uh, you don't wanna fly with me and, and I don't even wanna fly with myself. But for me, that tail rotor mishap was the final straw. I, I was flying over the city of Bomberg in Germany when I completely lost the tail rotor and we spun uncontrollably out of the sky and crashed through the roof of a Mercedes Benz showroom. Um, you know, the, the entire flight crew that was there, uh, my, the, cr the crew, our team, the good news is we had just let off our passengers. It was just the crew. It was Eddie Tibbs, Jay Hitchcock and Ken Hiddle. Uh, the four of us all miraculously made it out alive. We escaped from the burning wreckage of that aircraft and, and survived. Uh, but I, for, for me, it was a traumatic experience. And it made me think about yet another career change. And this is how I ended up going to law school. So I was fortunate enough that the Army sent me to law school. And I spent the, the next 25 years as a lawyer. And I, obviously, I had a blast. I was stationed all over the world as a prosecutor. Uh, um, and then after 9-11, I did two tours in Iraq and three tours in Afghanistan. Um, you know, here's a photo of me with a Marine lawyer in Afghanistan. And, and you know, I, I work with some amazing teams, uh, several tours with the special operations. And I'll just tell you that the people I worked with across the military, lawyers and the clients that we had were absolutely unbelievably superb human beings, smart, great lawyers, 
selfless public servants, uh, and as a group, some of the kindest people I've ever met. And another lesson I've learned is that kindness matters. Um, and that's probably not the sort of uh, a lesson you expected to hear from a general, but it, I think it matters in all aspects of life. Kindness is important. Um, another experience here I was uh, since trying to find pictures of me at, the, out, at sea. This one, I was aboard the US aircraft carrier uh, just off the coast of Iran, the USS Eisenhower. Um, and I'll say as, as the last few years as a, as a general, uh, I focused on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity. Oh, artificial intelligence, AI is everywhere around us. It's throughout our, our lives, Ron. And uh, you know, it's not just in business, but even in our everyday lives. We you Google something or you're shopping on Amazon, they're using their algorithms to, to try to assess what you need to buy or watch next. Um, and the Pentagon is the world's largest user of AI. And we have a lot of people committed to ensuring that the Pentagon does it right. I got to be part of that uh, ex experience there. Everyone thinks killer robots, uh, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. It, the Pentagon is a massive bureaucracy and uh, the vast majority of the projects that we're doing are, are just benign, innocuous projects designed to improve efficiency and reduce costs, just like most businesses across America and around the world are using AI for these days. Um, I guess to, to kind of close this up, I'll just say the other aspect of, of this technology, AI, but that I've learned is that any good strategy needs both an offense and a defense. And nearly everyone is leveraging AI as their offense to, to do what I said, improve efficiency and reduce costs out there, streamline operations. But as you use that as your offense, your defense needs to be cybersecurity. Because as you incorporate AI into your systems, you dramatically expose yourself to more cyber vulnerabilities. And if you just expand AI without doing a commensurate growth of cybersecurity to protect yourself, you're exposing yourself to ex extreme high risk out there. So I always say you have to have cybersecurity as an integral part of your plan, as, you, as the key defense in any strategy out there. And you know, as, as my time with the military came to an end a couple of months ago at the Pentagon, I'm, I'm, I'm now here and I'm able to continue the work that I do in AI and cybersecurity. I'm a, I'm a total nerd when it comes to the intersection of law and technology and, and super happy to be here near Silicon Valley uh, where we have the epicenter of all this technology. So with all that said, I, I, I know you wanted to leave a few minutes to ask me questions and I say, bring it on, especially if it's from any of your Naval Academy friends out there during, uh, during Navy Week. Where are we here now? Talk about this picture. This is New York City. This is a gala with the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines um, out there uh, celebrating together. Just kind of the bonds and the teamwork that are formed is just really second to none. And who's at the table with you? These are all lawyers from all the services, uh, all, all, all together recruiting uh, uh, great, great talent uh, from talented lawyers uh, from the Hispanic National Bar Association. These, this is like kind of a recruiting mission that we did. Uh, I'm no longer a recruiter, but I've got all sorts of things to, to, to recruit people with if, if they have any interest in joining the military. I, I couldn't have had a better time. You were uh, wonderful to share with us a story about you spinning out of control in a helicopter. That was pretty scary. Other than that, can you tell me a moment when you got scared? What made you scared in this service? Where was it? What was the setting? I think anytime anyone goes into combat, you're, 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 you're scared. Anyone who tells you otherwise, I think is probably not being honest with you or not being honest with themselves. Uh, but you, I think when you're there with friends, people you've trained with and worked with you, and, and, and who you trust, uh, it really makes it much easier to go through those scary experiences. I think the other times, I think for me, I was always scared of going into a court ill-prepared. You, you know, I, no one wants to go in, stand up in front of a jury, stand up in front of a boss, stand up in front of a judge, and not know what you're going to say. And so for me, it was in anticipation of these things. It was, it was kind of that, that, that positive stress that causes you to prepare and do uh, in productive levels of performance out there. And so for me, I found that this being a little bit scared pushes you to do better. So when you were an Army Ranger, how many combat missions were you on? Zero as a Ranger. Zero Ranger. So I want you to compare the game of being an Army Ranger. And as you know, we had as a guest recently, Mikhail Vinikov, 
who won the best ranger competition. He and his partner won that. So we had the number one army ranger and actually special forces men in America on our show. And uh, when I asked him about times that were scared, he told me sometimes he was scared, but you've had a broader range of experience. You were an army ranger and you were a lawyer. So tell me a time you were scared as a lawyer. And it goes back to, it, back to some of those things. I, later in my career, I had the, the, the real privilege of advising commanders making real-time life or death decisions. I, I, as, as a young lawyer, I advised colonels in combat, and, and I advised one-star generals in combat, two-star generals in combat, three-star generals in combat, and four-star generals in combat. Uh, the current uh, chief of staff of the Army, General Jim McConville, he was one of my clients. The current chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Mark Milley, was one of my clients. The current Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Lloyd Austin, was one of my clients. These are tough, smart clients, and they're counting on you to give them advice. That, and there's not a lot of time or room for error. It's not the sort of thing you can go back to a law office and, and start studying. You've got to know the answers. So this, what was scary for me is the fear that I would give them a wrong answer that would end up uh, taking someone's life inappropriately. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, but it's exactly what we train to do. And, and it really is the most exciting and exhilarating part of it. You, you, know, you want to be taking action that's appropriate against the right people. That's, that's what the military is, is there to do if necessary. You don't ever want for things to go astray and for you to strike the wrong people, for example. So give us an example of the issues. People understand when I say Army Ranger and dropping out in a helicopter on a building, they understand going down a fast road. But a, a lawyer, what are the issues? For me, my clients, these were my clients rather than what I was doing myself. No, what were the issues they needed your help with? They needed help with a couple of things. First is detention operations. Who can be detained and how do you take care of people who fall underneath your care once, you've, once they fall into detention? Everything from enemy prisoners of war to dealing with terrorists who fall into your care. They want to make sure they do it right, and, and they really count on you for that. The other big issue is targeting the, those strikes. If you're going to, if you're going to strike a, a vehicle or an aircraft or a building where, where there are ins people inside, you want to make sure you're getting the right people and not getting the wrong people. You're doing it not only with the legal standards, but you're meeting at moral ethical standards where you can sleep well at night, look yourself in the mirror. And so give us some examples. So we were educated. What are examples of some of the legal issues? Let's say you're in Afghanistan. Your client comes to you and says, I want to strike this particular uh, building. Give us some examples of issues that you... It's you work with the rest of your counterparts. You have an intelligence officer who can tell you what she thinks is in that building and what the basis of, of her belief is. You have an operations officer that also tells you what they believe to be the value of striking that. And then the commander is trying to weigh all of these factors, say, should we strike or should we not strike? What's the value? And is there going to be collateral damage? If so, how much? And you're helping remind the commander of exactly what the standards are to apply, the legal standards. You're getting everyone else's input so it's an informed decision. You're making recommendations. And then ultimately, the commanders, your clients, make that call. It's, it's fascinating work, Ron. It's, it's super exhilarating, uh, but it's a lot of pressure uh, particularly on those commanders who are making those calls and have to live with the consequences. So give us an example, a real life example. So I know you won't use names, but give us an example of a case where he wanted to, a, a client wanted to do something and you ultimately said no. And then I that's, asked, pre that's pretty rare. I will tell you, a, a lot of times I would say, uh, I, you, you probably can. We probably have enough to get. And I'll tell you, this is a far more frequent one where we'd say, you probably have enough. You could do this legally, um, but... But do you really want to? Do you want to wait till you, we can refine the intelligence just a little bit more? Or do you want to go now? Now, sometimes, Ron, and this might sound counterintuitive, as you, as you wait a little bit longer to get more intelligence, uh, the intelligence that you had goes stale. And so if you wait too long, um, sometimes you actually get your, find yourself in a worse situation than you were before. And it may have been better to make your decision earlier. Um, that's kind of the nature because, you know, war is a competition where you're not just trying to, to learn, you're trying to learn faster than your enemies learn. You're trying to maneuver faster than your enemy is maneuvering. So it makes it dynamic and exciting. So give me kind of a cleanse uh, case study. So uh, it's, it's a building, there's 20 people inside or two, and uh, you learn a, B, and C factors that lead you to want to make the strike. And yeah. they come to you and say, can we? Give, me any, give us a case study. Well, you're looking to figure out what? Who, who is in there and how do you know there's in there? What, what makes you think you know who's in there and who's not? 
How long have you been watching that building? Do you have, how have you had eyes on? Has it been continuous eyes on? Has it been interrupted? And if so, what could have happened? Might there be other people who you don't know are in there? And then you, got, you throw some common sense and logic to, to people's human nature and normal routines and patterns of life and everything. You're, you're, everyone's trying to do the best they can to make the best assessment. Sometimes people have different opinions, uh, but ultimately it comes down to commanders who are responsible for making these calls. They listen to the advice of all the experts on their staffs. And then that commander, she makes the tough decision. And, and then you, you hope uh, it was a good one. And in the vast majority of cases, it, it was. So I would say that the, the U.S. military is extraordinarily careful when it comes to these things. I couldn't be more proud of my teammates out there. So when the uh, United States invaded Iraq and we went, you know, city to city, I believe from the south to the north, a friend of mine was uh, part of the attack on Fallujah. So using Fallujah or a place like that as an example, would you get a call once a week, once a day, once every hour? How often would you ask if there was permission? And was that what they'd ask? Permission to make a strike? What would be the, what would be the question you'd get? No, I think that, that's a great point because the vast majority of these use of force decisions are made at the, at the level of, a, of an 18-year-old soldier or Marine who's having to make an on-the-spot call because his or her life is in jeopardy at that moment. The, tra the training and the preparation comes before when they understand the laws of war, who they can shoot, who they can't shoot, when they can exercise um, force when, or leverage force when they can't. They're making these decisions day in and day out. In firefights, they're making hundreds of decisions uh, in, in an hour, over the course of an hour without any lawyers involved. Uh, the, the decisions I'm talking about are kind of the bigger, higher level decisions made by headquarters levels, by the colonels and the generals out there who are doing airstrikes and things like that. But, but I should I, I think that's a good point. What I was talking about is sort of the 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 minimal, uh, the, the the exception, whereas the norm is a decision made by an individual soldier to squeeze the bullet trigger. And so since the average person in our audience knows almost nothing about these kinds of decisions, it's helpful for you to give me some examples. For instance, do you get any calls from sergeants? What layer do you get calls from? Who would contact you? As, as a lawyer, I was getting calls from colonels and generals. Colonels and generals. Yep. And, so, and so they're calling you in there. And how long do they give you to make a decision? It, it, it varies widely. But from what to what? From one minute? Sometimes it was, I needed, I needed a, a recommendation right now. Mm -hmm. And is it almost always that they're worried about civilian casualties? Uh, or is it that they don't know that the protocol of the battlefield fits the circumstance? What's the typical? No, they're, they're at that level of colonels and generals, they're very familiar with the rules and they just want to make sure they, they get the benefit of having an, an expert on, on those rules in there to advise them on it. They, they know the rules. Yes, they're very concerned about civilian casualties, but the law is actually fairly permissive in collateral damage. Uh, but, but as a practical matter, there are huge, significant consequences uh, for, for having collateral damage, even if it's a legal strike. And so you think through, you talk through the, the, the potential consequences and the, how, how confident you feel in these strikes. And again, if, if sometimes it was, I need an answer right now. This is the only shot we're going to get. Uh, we're going to either take it or not based on your input right now. Others, other times you'd have days to go back and, and confer and make, and, and make recommendations. So I know this is a tough one, but can you remember times when you said, no, let's not strike, and later on you said, darn it, I wish we would have? No. The reciprocal question is begging itself. What about times when you said, yes, let's go, and yep. later on you said, uh-oh, we, yep. we, we shouldn't have. Yeah, Did I would say over, over the, you know, if you talk about the fog of war, the chaos of the battlefield, you don't, you never operate with perfect information. You know, you're operating, you have about 20% sometimes you're hoping 25, 30% of visibility on the truth out there. And you're trying to make the best decisions you can on, on what you have it. Uh, there's never been once where I made it, where I made a recommendation or a commander took an action that I said, oh, we should never have taken that. But there are times where I said, based on what we knew at the time, we were good, but it turned out in retrospect, uh, we didn't know what we, we didn't know what we, what we, or what we thought we knew was wrong. And it turned out to be bad strikes. And unfortunately, civilian casualties is a, is or just kind of an inevitable consequence of war. It's a terrible consequence of war. Frankly, that's one of the great advantages of, or potential advantages of artificial intelligence and some of these systems out there that can give commanders 
better visibility on the battlefield, better awareness of what's on the battlefield if used properly. There are some significant risks with using it, but that's a lot of what we were trying to do was improve uh, the targeting, reduce collateral damage out there, and overall just be a more effective force, even greater compliance with the law of war. Now, I would imagine some of the battlefield decisions rely upon uh, you know, in theater advisors who are not Americans, but who are Afghans, Afghanis, or Iraqs, Iraqis, who are, are, are befriending the Americans. And you have to constantly decide whether this X, Y, or Z person is uh, trustworthy or not trustworthy or basically setting us up. We Americans keep imagining, oh, they gave us bad advice to make us look bad so that we had more uh, you know, civilian casualties at a particular rate. Can you talk a little bit about that, that incredible process of selecting a good advisor on the ground in Iraq or Afghanistan citizen who is siding with the Americans and giving you information? Talk about that. Yeah, so super important assessment, and you're right. In, in both of those wars, we were there largely to help the local population, to help prop up the local government, to help uh, promote their army. And you have to take a leap of faith and, and work closely with them. They are your partners. They're the, they're your, the purpose for being there. You work closely with them to ensure that they're as successful as they can. If, if, if you're not willing to do that, then you're, gonna, you're, you're, you're simply ignoring the bigger picture. Are there risks? Of course there are. Is, is everybody perfect? Is everybody who you think they are? No. Uh, that, so it is with life, and you have to just accept those risks, minimize them where you can, do the best betting that you can, um, and then deal with uh, the consequences if, if you find out you were wrong. Sometimes you're wrong. That's the way life goes. Talk to us about your decision cycle. Are you doing um, 20 such decisions like this in a week? Or it depends, of course, when you're in attack mode. Give us some sense about you know, uh, your kind of workflow, if you will, about these kinds of cases. And are they momentary, but are they always documented? How often do you have to document an opinion you've given a colonel or a general? It, everything is documented, carefully documented, even if it's just verbally uh, given in, in, in the spur of the moment, there's a, it's, it's documented so people know what we've done. But we're, we're careful because what we really like to do is on those occasions where we make mistakes and these happen, we like to go back, these, uh, deconstruct them, uh, do a post-mortem and learn from them. Uh, because if you're not willing to admit your mistakes, learn from them and improve, uh, then you're simply not going to ever be successful. And that, that's true, I think, in all walks of life and all professions. So yeah, we would go through. And the, the frequency of them would vary greatly depending on where you were in the, in the cycle, what, what roles you had. I, I deploy in, in, in one case, I was a prosecutor in Afghanistan and there uh, wasn't doing much of the advising on strikes at all, um, but just working criminal cases, which are tend to be much slower, um, much bigger efforts, but, but just slower process. And who do you report to in those kind of in those contexts when you're doing uh, when you're making these strikes? Who do you report up to? Um, two two people. You you work for a commander who is the decision maker, and if that's your commander, that's your client. Um, but you also have a, a chain of lawyers that goes all the way back to the Pentagon who can give, can help you, um, guide you on the law and make sure everyone is aligned and doing the right thing. So if you ever have questions, say, hey, I'm not sure about this, there's someone you can go to. And who, what, would, what titles would those, those lawyer authorities that you would refer to be? Uh, I, I, two, two different titles. One would be either the general counsel or the staff judge advocate. So if you were going to give a young person advice about being um, both of these roles, an army ranger, what would you tell them that, that's, that you liked best about that work? I'll tell you, it, it, you know, I, I love the adventure. I love the travel. I love seeing and doing a lot of things. I love the fact that I had a lot of responsibility kind of right out of law school or right out of college. Um, but, but that's not the, the best thing. The, the best thing is the people with whom you work, the quality of the people. You know, don't go in the military if you're in if you're in this for the money. And that's not the right place for you. But if you like adventure, you like teamwork, and you really want to be part of a team and people who are willing to lay it all down for you, uh, it's a really satisfying place to work at any level in any job across the Department of Defense. Now you went from right, you know, worked your way up to be a general, a brigadier general. Now you're retired. Is a brigadier general going to be your last post in the army once you're retired? Are you ever going to be promoted to a two-star? What's the typical? No, no, my time in the army is done, Ron. They, they, my, my tour is up 35 years. Uh, they're, they're done with me, um, but I, I loved every minute of it, but I'm happy to be able to move on to the next phase here. 
By the way, whatever they were feeding you in the army, it's hard to believe that you were there for 35 years because you don't look as old as that uh, tenure would suggest. Um, now back to the, another question. What about uh, being a lawyer in the army? What, what did you like about that? Uh, it, but for me, that's, that's, I was referring to that a little bit earlier as well. Yeah, I know you asked just about the range, but I'll say there is no place where you can get better legal experience and have more legal responsibility as a young attorney uh, than, than the JAG Corps. Again, if, you, if you're looking for that mahogany panel, beautiful office overlooking San Francisco, you know, we are not the right law firm for you. But, but you really, if you want to be part of a great team, you want to test things out, you want to try cases, you want to do some really important work for those commanders and, and work shoulder to shoulder with commanders who are making life or death decisions, it's, it, it's untouchable by any other career. Even if you want to go in contracting, we do some of the largest government contracts in the world, no one ever thinks contract law when you think army lawyer, uh, but multi-billion dollar IT contracts, um, litigation, both civil litigation, as well as criminal litigation in the military, the opportunities are endless. And for any lawyer starting out, I'd say, give it a shot. So um, how many lawyers does the army have? Just over 5,000. And what percent of them are stationed in DC somewhere? Very small percentage in D.C. I'd say a couple hundred in the D.C. area. So give us the org structure for the legal staff within the Army. Okay, within the Army, we have, a, we have uh, five generals uh, who run the day-to-day -day active duty uh, operations. Uh, three of them are in Washington, D.C., and uh, two of them are just outside Washington, D.C. Uh, that's the overall structure. But then really what we have are about 70 uh, field legal offices, each one run by a colonel or a lieutenant colonel, depending on the size and the complexity of the mission. And, and, and they run their team. It's usually like a multi It's like a, a normal law firm that has contract law, criminal law, legal assistance for family law matters, um, that does national security law or international law, some of the targeting issues we discussed today, and anything else that the local command may need it to do. Just a, a great variety of law. And that's, for me, Getting to bounce around from one thing, from, from one thing to another was part of the variety that, that I enjoyed quite a bit. So you just mentioned domestic law. So if a guy's in the service, a person is in the service, and they get separated and ultimately divorced, what legal function does our uh, Army lawyer have in such a procedure? The Army lawyers help through the initial stages, through the separation process, getting separation agreements. The only thing they don't normally do is appear in court or uh, in civil matters like that. But they'll help most people through the vast majority of the process. So in the same way that uh, you go to Walter Reed to get fixed up when you're hurt, injured, in, in, and that's a hospital, you're saying that the Army provides legal support for uh, soldiers, military, who have to go through domestic uh, disputes, squabbles, divorces. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. so. If you basically were going to start over again and you were going to begin your career, what would you do different? I would uh, be a little more careful with, with flying. I, um, I would pre free flight my helicopters a little more carefully, see what I can catch. I'd be more careful with my parachute jumps. Um, and uh, other than that, I, I think I would just trust more in the people around me and my subordinates. I try to take those lessons that I learned later from people like uh, Major Tom Young and, and try to apply them earlier. So now our military posture is moving from NATO-centric when the Soviet Union was a big potential threat to us to Asia Pacific now with China being a commercial and intelligence and potentially a cyber threat. Uh, how does the army posture relative to China? I mean, where are their bases? And um, tell us about how you as a lawyer could feel that shift. Happening. I think everyone in the military feels the, the, the shift, um, you know, the potential uh, controversy or potential competition that are experienced between the United States and China. It's, it's pretty obvious. I think everyone is tracking it. The good news is that despite that competition, I think that there's a lot of interdependence with, uh, with, with China and the United States, economic, financial independence. Both sides really rely on the other uh, for their financial well-being. I think that provides a stabilizing factor globally. Uh, that's a good thing. Yes, there's tension. Yes, there, there, there can be um, the talk back and forth. But, but overall, 
I, I think neither wants to see anything go astray and wants things to make, for the most part, maintain the status quo. I think long term, uh, everyone's trying to not only keep up with the Joneses, but try to go out, outpace the competition. And that's one of these areas that you see a, a global arms race in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, United States is the kind of the acknowledged leader right now, but the overall, a lot of people assess that China is closing the gap and uh, rapidly in the eyes of some. And so a lot of discussion about how the United States can or should maintain some superiority in the high tech world. And again, we are at the epicenter of that here in both Silicon Valley and technology and the potential out there. The tech, Silicon Valley has traditionally been the hub of military technology. And it's only been the last couple of decades that the, the real advances in technology have been made in the civilian sector rather than the military sector. Changes our approach a bit. We're now pulling uh, technology off of commercial operations, commercial opportunities, and, and uh, migrating it over into the military for use there. Drones are increasingly used uh, in replacing airplanes, helicopters. And you, I'm sure, are asked, were asked frequently, can I make a drone strike here? Does it make a difference that it's a drone versus some other um, assault form? From a legal perspective, it honestly doesn't make a whole lot of difference. And that's because people say drone, and it's a little misleading, like the thing is doing it on its own. And it's not. It's just, it's just remotely piloted. And so you've still got a pilot that's looking at things. The pilot just happens to rather be looking directly out the, the side of an aircraft or something looking through a computer screen who's displaced by some geographical distance out there. So from a legal perspective, it's not a lot of, it's, it's not a lot different. You still want to ask the same questions and assess your level of certainty and in the information you're using to base your decision. Essentially, when you were in the Middle East, you'd be paying attention to those Middle Eastern issues. And uh, were you perfectly aware of what's going on with Yemen and the, the uh, Saudi uh, support for the Yemenis attacks? Yes. In, yes. Okay, and so uh, give us some examples of issues that you would think about or contemplate there. I will tell you that one of the large issues that was in the papers quite a bit is uh, the level of responsibility that the United States might have for the actions of Saudi Arabia as, the, as their ally, um, and not only as a regular ally of Saudi Arabia, but as an ally that provides support to Saudi Arabia. So different levels of belief out there about if let's say let's say that there was something done that was not appropriate, that was uh, improper, done by one government, could another government be held responsible for the actions of, of a second government? That's one of the most common legal issues you'll see with uh, what I would call proxy wars, like you uh, that you we saw a lot in, uh, in Yemen. In my introduction, I mentioned the weaponization of immigrants. Increasingly, we see in uh, South uh, Central America, and we see in um, Syria, and now up on the Polish border, we see um, foreign actors deliberately pushing immigrants into um, uh, NATO or into America to sort of disrupt what's going on inside of uh, their targeted country. They're using, it sounds incredibly heinous, but they're actually using immigrants as pawns on this uh, geopolitical um, chessboard. Uh, talk to us a little bit about legal issues you may have encountered in that realm. No real new legal issues. In, in fact, that's a, a kind of a timeless problem. I don't see that as, as anything really new. You know, throughout history, you've had to be concerned about people infiltrating spies, um, you know, espionage is, is, is alive and well, not just uh, national security espionage, but commercial espionage as well. Do you ever pay attention to issues around the Mexican border, the military infiltration of bad guys down there? Very rare. That's more of a domestic issue than, than you would typically see. Sometimes you'll, some of the issues are when can uh, military forces be sent either in a federal capacity or in a state capacity to support uh, border operations, but really it's a, it's a fairly uh, uncommon issue. Patrick, it's been fascinating listening to the crossover between straight military experience and the legal issues around and support decisions on making attacks and not making attacks and so on. Thanks very much for sharing your insights with us. It's been very thought-provoking to have you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks a lot, Ron. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.